Thank you for tuning in to Adversity University and welcome to class. Today's guest, Tyler Smith, survival of the Humboldt Broncos bus crash. For those of you who don't know what the Humboldt Broncos hockey team went through about two seasons ago, they were on a way to a playoff game in Saskatchewan and their bus was T-boned by a semi-truck. It resulted in the death of 16 people as well as injuries to 13 more. And this really hit close to home for the entire hockey community. I know me personally, it made me reflect on how many bus trips I've taken for granted. You go on bus trips everywhere in AAA hockey, junior hockey, college hockey, you know, all of my best friends are on bus trips all around the country and even the world now at the same time. And it was just crazy to step back and think that this could have happened to anybody. We can't thank Tyler enough for opening up to us and coming on and sharing some of this experience because we want to talk about the hardest parts of life. And it is hard to talk about these things, but he's gained a lot of perspective from this tragedy. And we hope that this episode can really help someone out there because one of the toughest things in life is losing a loved one. Garrett, what did you think about this episode? Yeah, I thought it was really good. And it hit close to home, like you mentioned, just because we all play hockey or, you know, at least everyone involved with Adverse University does. And um, so I hit really close to home because that could have been us at any point in time. And, you know, every time you're on the bus now, it just kind of makes you think um, that in a flash of a light or, you know, a blink, it can, it can be over. But it was just unbelievable to hear how positive he stayed through the whole thing and just kind of how he's coped with the situation. And uh, I just loved hearing how, you know, we see it from the outside world, how tight the uh, hockey community is, but just hearing it from, you know, Tyler's own words and his perspective on how much support the hockey community had on him and his family and everybody else that was affected by that. And also one thing I love about this episode is that we don't just dive into the, um, you know, the bus crash Tyler's, a person like anybody else and he went through a lot of other adversity too so I think you're going to get a lot of different sides of um, adversity and how they uh, can affect anybody. Yeah I agree I really liked learning more about him as a person before the crash because everybody goes through tough times and a lot of people only focus on him for this one instance now when he has an entire life and we get into how that grieving process has changed from the initial reaction to now two years later. And so I think there's a lot of really helpful advice in this episode and really looking forward to see what you guys think. Make sure to let us know. Let's kick it on over to Tyler. For all you listeners out there that don't know where Garrett and I began our hockey journey, it was with the Colorado Rampage, where a list of other notable alumni also began their career as young student athletes. The Colorado Rampage AAA hockey program is currently accepting registrations for their tryouts and identification camps to find elite players and people looking to play AAA hockey and take their career to the next level. The Rampage play in the Tier 1 Elite League, which is one of the best AAA leagues in the country. This is where your players will get to showcase their skill in front of scouts for the best junior teams, colleges, and even professional teams in North America. We would encourage anyone between the ages of 12 and 18 who are looking for a place to develop and start their hockey career the same way we did to send an email to play AAA at coloradorampage.org to get more information. That's P-L-A-Y-A-A-A at C-O-R-A-M-P-A-G-E dot org. You can also visit their website at www.corampage.com. Be better today than you were yesterday and join the herd. On April 6, 2018, the Humboldt Broncos Junior A hockey team was on their way to a playoff game in Saskatchewan, Canada. On the trip, their bus was struck by a semi-truck in a collision that took the lives of 16 people and injured another 13. Tyler Smith was one of those injured. He suffered eight different injuries, including a broken collarbone, a broken shoulder blade, and nerve damage down his left arm. He went through two surgeries and spent 13 days in the hospital. The following season, he was one of three members who were able to return to play for the Broncos. Since then, he has become a public speaker and a writer advocating for mental health. Tyler Smith, thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thanks very much for having me. Glad to be on. 
Yeah, we're excited to have you. And uh, before we get into, uh, to the infamous day, which Humble is unfortunately synonymous for, uh, I'd love to learn more about you growing up. What was it like growing up in Leduc, uh, just outside of Edmonton, Alberta? Uh, I loved it. I mean, I uh, I think it was a perfect little city to to definitely start my little hockey career as well. Um, obviously, being from Edmonton, there's a you're going to be up against a ton of ton of big names. Uh, your Tyler Bensons and your and your big names like that, and you can't really uh, you can't really shine, I guess. So. Um, being able to grow up in Ladue can actually just form a good foundation with my hockey buddies and, and just go to the rink every day. And more of a smaller community, it's definitely grown. But um, I think the living in Ladue and growing up in Ladue is a big, uh, big part of the person I am today. When we spoke before, you mentioned that you would describe yourself as a locker room player. Could you explain this role for the listeners and some of the challenges that come with it? Yeah, so... I mean, personally, growing up, I, I definitely wanted to be that scorer. I wanted to be that skill guy. I wanted to be somebody who could be relied upon in the O zone and in the D zone. But um, once I got to junior, junior A, I definitely realized that the dressing room role was more of what I think I was going to thrive in. So um, when I got to Drain Valley, um, I realized I was going to be a third, fourth line guy, maybe a little PK here and there. So I definitely had to shine in the dressing room and try and and try and just fit that mold and fit that role and, and do it well. So um, coming into the room every day, you definitely want to be that guy that, that makes everybody laugh. You want to you wanna be that guy that everybody can kind of rely on to, to just, you know, whether it's a smile, whether it's a laugh, or whether it's just somebody that can kind of come to you to just, to just lean on. Um, so it, the one thing with that role is it definitely can get exhausting. Um, I realized that in Drayton and Humboldt, um, you don't get a day off. I think everybody expects you to always be on your A game and, and that can kind of take a toll on you. So um, there was one, one moment in Humboldt where that definitely took a toll on me. And, and I know even in Drayton Valley, it's, I mean, when you're not playing 20 minutes a night um, and you're kind of still expected to be that fun guy, even after a big win where you maybe played four minutes like it's it's hard and it's it's difficult and it's different I, I know a lot of people maybe don't understand that role but um, I think a team still needs that role and needs that guy so I definitely wanted to fit that mold and I wanted to thrive in that position but it was uh, it got difficult at times. That definitely is a huge asset to a team like you said four minutes a night doesn't seem like a lot on paper but when you're coming to the rink every day it may sound crazy but even as an athlete playing the game you love, there are dog days. And, you know, the middle of the season, there's that grind and that stretch where you really need a guy to just lighten the mood to make practice more fun because when the guys are having fun, you know, you're going to work harder and just enjoying being there is huge for a team's chemistry. So that's a huge role. Yeah, as a, as a backup goalie, you know, I've been a backup every step of my journey, AAA, junior, college. Um, and, you know, at times you have to fill a certain role like that too. And me and Sean like to refer to those guys as the glue guys. And if you don't have the glue guys on your team, like it doesn't keep the team together. Um, so we're thankful to have guys like you. And like you mentioned, I've been in that situation before, and it's hard to show up every day because you're expected to show up and work hard and be your best self and try to push your, your teammates to be better. But you also have to bring this positive mental attitude and when things aren't really going your way in life, and especially in hockey, which is a big part of our lives, it's really mentally draining. But, um, no, that's a good point. And uh, we definitely need guys like that on our team to, you know, keep us focused and stuff. But um, was there a time in your junior career or at all when you were playing hockey when you questioned whether or not you could continue to, you know, play under this role? Um, yeah, there was definitely uh... – a couple times I think during my kind of more minor hockey days that that never really crossed my mind just because growing up in a smaller community like Leduc you can still I was still relied upon I you know I, I could still go out and score goals I could still play power play I could still do quite a bit and I could actually thrive and and be a dressing room guy but also be a guy that can can play first line minutes second line minutes just because I mean at the end of the day you're not playing junior hockey where every guy is fighting for a spot every single day so um, once I kind of made the transition to to Drain Valley um, I don't think there was any specific moments in Drain my Drain time in Drain Valley um, it was actually my 19 year old season when I came back to Drain Valley um, I was 
I was told that I was on the way out. And I mean, that was pretty shocking because I just finished up a good training camp. I was, I was ready for a kind of a fresh start, a new season. I worked hard in the off season and, and the coach called me in and said I was going to get traded to LaRange, Saskatchewan. I was like, well, like for everybody who kind of knows this part of Canada, it's definitely not where you exactly want to be. Um, so I was left kind of saying that, man, I'm just, I'm good good with another spot so he kind of told me to to figure it out on my own and and that was a tough spot to be in as well because I mean for a junior hockey player you're never really told to to just go out and find a team I mean some guys have agents but I was definitely not the guy to have an agent my stats didn't show enough to to really put myself in a spot to have an agent so I was left calling around teams and and I think for a month straight I was calling and and a lot of times I was like is this worth it like I mean I could end up in a spot where I don't really love it and I'm doing all this calling and and having to find ice time to go stay in shape and and all that so that was a big big moment where I I actually almost ended my career but um, once I found Humboldt which was the only kind of coach that Darcy Hogan gave me the opportunity to come and I drove six hours I loaded up my jeep and I was like okay I'm gonna do this and hopefully I'm in good enough shape and and it all worked out, but um, there was a there was a little stint during my hu- time in Humboldt where I was exhausted and I was mentally drained and I was like, okay, I'm playing four minutes a night. Like, why should I just keep coming to the room every day, acting like I'm the happiest human in the world? And and um, then I had teammates come up to me and kind of be like, what's going on? Like, what's wrong? Like, we need you back. Like, I'll go talk to Darcy. Like, do you want more ice time? Like, what's going on? Like, we value you. And that kind of changed my perspective and my point of view. And, and I was like, okay, well, I'm, I, I'm valued and, and I'm appreciated and, and, and that's big for me. So I definitely decided to stay. And I think that was a, a huge decision for me and it led to many more great memories. But uh, yeah, those were kind of two moments where it, it definitely started to take a toll on me. And because at the end of the day, hockey's a grind and it's a business, especially when you get into junior, it is a business and you're a piece of meat sometimes. So it's uh, it was a it was took a toll, but I'm happy I stuck with it. Yeah, one of the best parts about hockey to me is that it is a team sport, and even though some guys are the ones scoring the goals every night, it's a family, and every single member is very important. And it's awesome that your teammates noticed that. It's what it sounds like pretty quickly, and they were able to come up and talk to you and help you work through that time in your life. But when you were at home waiting for that next team, you said it was about a month what did you kind of do to mentally stay in it? I know a lot of people don't understand junior hockey. Obviously as a Canadian, you probably have a little bit more uh, people up there who kind of understand your path, but down here, when you're explaining what you're doing with junior hockey, people don't really get it. They don't really understand chasing the dream. So when you were at home for about a month without a team, how did you mentally stay focused to keep driving toward that goal? Yeah, I, I I can't really recall like exactly what I did mentally, but I just I think more or less I was just trying to stay physically in it because I mean when you're not playing junior hockey, you're not on the ice every day, and that's a big thing. And and your conditioning goes down quick. You can't just go ride a bike. So luckily, I knew the I knew I think I knew the like the main recreation center guy. So I found some ice and I started skating with the midget team here and my brother's team, and I was able to still find ice. But the mental side of it was tough just because you're getting these rejections from all these coaches. And, and I mean, those rejections are, were adding up and, and I was really starting to, to weigh down my options. Like I didn't have many people left. I think I called every coach in Alberta and I called a few in BC and I called a couple in Saskatchewan. So, I mean, the numbers were adding up and, and I was definitely starting to uh, beat myself up, up about it. But I mean, I relied on my family and I relied on kind of my friends that were still in the game to, to give me that hope that, I mean, my dream was still going to stay alive, but it was a, uh, it was a challenge mentally and physically. I think that's just a testament to your character. I mean, obviously I don't know you personally and Sean doesn't either, but just the things you're talking about being a good teammate and, you know, finding a way to stay in it mentally. I can just say from talking to you, that's a testament to your character and to come to the rink every day with that attitude and that mindset. And Sean talks about, hockey's being a family you did it for your teammates and your brothers next to you you know what I mean because you cared about them and as you mentioned it showed that they cared about you too when you were down you know they were there to pick you up and that's what you know hockey teams do and it's such a fun culture to be around Um, and you learn so much but getting into the crash uh, an article on globalnews.ca says that you don't remember anything until a few days after the crash 
what was the moment like waking up with your family surrounding you, um, you know, when you finally came, came to? Yeah, so I, I can't really recall, like, which exact day. Um, I don't remember any, anything from the, the crash day, and then I don't remember anything from about probably three or four days after, because, I mean, I, I don't think I woke up for a couple of days. And then, I mean, I was instantly on morphine drip, so um, my parents, luckily, were the ones that helped ease me into it, just because, obviously, there was a ton of friends and family around, and you have you have big-name hockey players like Connor McDavid coming in, and and I mean, I think we had the prime minister come in. So, I mean, obviously you have a, these people coming in and it makes you wonder, but um, my parents and my friends and family did a good job of kind of easing, like easing me into what was actually going on. Um, obviously waking up in a hospital bed strapped to, to four wires and everything was, was tough to wake up to, but I think I was just so groggy and so tired that the, the first couple of days that I just, I couldn't really understand anything. So once I started to actually understand and what was going on, I think it was, uh, yeah, I think that it was just complete shock. And I mean, I, I don't think there was any way to really absorb everything that was going on. And I mean, I remember kind of watching a couple funerals from my hospital bed and, and even that was like, just, it just like felt like nothing was really hitting. Like it was just like so soon and it was so, so different, so unique. And, and I mean, I'm happy that my friends and family were around me constantly supporting me and, and being there, but it was a, it was a different journey. Like it was a different kind of way to, to figure out what was going on just because it was so heavy. So obviously my parents didn't want to just put it all on me at once, but at the end of the day, it was such a, such a big topic around all social media and all news so I mean at the end of the day it was hard to keep me away from it but it was uh I think I'm grateful for my parents of kind of how they eased me into it you started touching on it how they gave you the news in pieces rather than everything at once but one of the hardest things we face in life as humans is losing loved ones how have you mourned your brothers from those days following the crash? And how has that mourning process changed over the past two years? Yeah, I mean, it's, and that's another thing too. It's, it's just such a, it was such a unique situation for all of us. It's, um, I mean, you have 13 survivors and then 29 families total. So um, it was just, uh, it was so unique and, and so different of how we would approach this just because it was to such high magnitude and to such degree. And, there was so much loss and and I mean each person was so different and each person each person we lost had such a personality and and I mean it's it's very difficult to kind of like put into words like how special that team was so um I personally wish I could mourn all day every day but um I think we still have to kind of get on or not get on we still have to move forward with our lives and and live that the way they would want us to so um, now it's just, I mean, we, I have humble stuff all over my house. Um, I always talk to them. I have stickers everywhere. I have stickers on my car and, and I mean, each year on the anniversary, I do something different to honor everybody. And, and I mean, I think it's just, it's different for everybody and everybody heals differently and everybody's growth looks different. So, um, I'm sure everybody's doing it differently, but I, I, I personally don't think there's no right or wrong way to do it. It's just kind of how you want to do it. So I've, I found peace in kind of just just talking to them and and just saying hi and and looking at photos and and writing down old memories and and just just making people realize how special each of these human beings were. Yeah, I want to take a step back a little and you talk about the shock that you go through and I think that it really just shocked the entire hockey world as a whole because as we've played junior hockey and even in college you take those bus rides and to be honest, that's the last thing on your mind. You never once think about that something that tragic is going to happen. You know, you have guys sleeping on the bus. There's not really seat belts. Like guys are kind of doing their own thing. So for that to come out of left field, like I, I still can't even comprehend to this day. Like it's so, and now that that has happened, like sometimes when I'm on the bus, to be honest, like I'm more conscious of it. Like I have a, a, a harder time sleeping. I try to stay upright and just be in a comfortable position or, you know, some of those bus rides get sketchy if the weather's kind of bad. So, um, but the driver of that semi truck that crashed into your bus was coming west at an intersection when your team's bus was traveling north. He ignored a stop sign and pleaded guilty to his charges of reckless driving and is now serving an eight year sentence in prison. Do you think you'll ever be able to forgive him? 
Um, yeah, I've been asked this question before, and I'm I look at it the way of I don't think he woke up that day intending to do that. And at the end of the day, I think it was just a matter of unfortunately he made a mistake and it was a massive mistake and I don't think he'll ever be able to live with himself for that. And I don't think there's ever going to be full forgiveness for it, but at the end of the day, he made a mistake. And um, there was a story about one of this um, parents of one of the boys who uh, we lost um, went in a room with him. And actually, I guess he, he, the driver just bawled his eyes out and just continually said, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. And I'm sorry. And, and I think that just goes to show that he he came to this country trying to just, you know, make a living for his family. And he didn't get the proper training and he didn't have all the proper requirements. And, and that unfortunately caused a mistake that lost a lot of lives. And um, so, yeah, that, that question is tough just because I, I definitely, I know that he didn't wake up that day intending to do that. So I, I kind of fall back on that. And I want forgiveness because I, I don't want to be someone that kind of always has that grudge. But at the end of the day, there's always kind of going to be that grudge. So it, it's a tough question. But um, I think there can be forgiveness in the future. The hockey community is very tight. Like we talked about within teams, it's very tight. But as we learned from this incident, the entire world hockey community is, is very tight. One possible silver lining in this tragedy was witnessing how everyone came together in support. Uh, Garrett talked about it briefly, how everyone kind of started putting themselves in that situation. And I know many mothers were thinking of how it could have been any team of young men on that bus. And it hit so close to home that a group of young men just chasing their dreams could go through such a terrible tragedy. A GoFundMe was started to help pay the medical bills and support the Humboldt players and families. And it actually raised over $15 million Canadian. What did this global support mean to you and your other surviving players? Um, I, I mean, I can't speak for all the other surviving players or the, or the families of those who we lost, but I think for us, like, it was just something to, to kind of just smile about, just to see that the way that the whole country and the whole world was just rallying and, and the support was just so immense and so massive. And, and it was honestly, it helped us get through some days, just, just because we knew that we had a lot of people in our corner and we had a lot of people that just wanted to see us happy and succeed and, and move forward. And, and we had a lot of people that were always thinking about us and always praying for us. And we had a lot of people put their sticks out by their doors or, or just send us notes. And, and we, I, we had a bunch of schools that were just wrote us a bunch of cards and pictures were sent. And, and yeah, the money alone, like, I, I mean, I couldn't believe it. I, once I started to really come to my mom just kept, that, like telling me what the GoFundMe was at and I couldn't believe it and I, and I always kind of thank people for for that alone just because that the money that was raised was so incredible and and it will definitely be something that I'll always look back on and be so fond of and be so thankful for and grateful for just because that just shows the way that the hockey is truly one big family and, and one big community and and I know, I mean, I still have a ton of support from all over Canada, like Newfoundland and everywhere. So um, we, uh, we, I, I mean, my family alone, I know we are super grateful and super appreciative of, of just the, the GoFundMe and all the support and all the continued support. And, and I, I don't think we'll ever be able to truly thank everybody for that just because it was so massive. There was a cool image I saw of um, the tattoo you got to remember your teammates. Can you kind of go through the thinking that went into that and why you decided to go with that image? Yeah, so I did 16 blackbirds under my uh, left shoulder here, and or I guess under my left clavicle where I've got my surgery. And, and uh, I just wanted to kind of have something on my body that truly just remembered them. And I, I thought blackbirds was kind of a, a, a good representation of, of that just because they were all such – they were all such amazing – individuals but they just came together and we were such a family so just kind of having them fly high above my heart and and I have a little quote that says home is where the heart is because just because humble will always be such a home to me and and that's always kind of where my heart will be and and I mean obviously I grew up in Leduc and my my home's here but I think I'll always have a special place in my heart for humble so 
Um, I wanted to do something and it was definitely not an easy decision. I, I didn't just get up and say, okay, I'm doing this, but um, I'm super happy with it. And I'm, I'm sure I'll kind of get more tattoos over the years just because personally, I love tattoos. And I think I will, uh, I want to just kind of remember each individual so much and, and do so much for each individual just because they were so special. So I love how you chose to commem uh, commemorate them. Uh, and I thought it was cool going back a little bit. I, I loved how the hockey community would put sticks out for Humboldt. I thought that was really cool. And we mentioned it multiple times that the hockey world is so small and you don't realize how small it is until you get older. And, you know, you're kind of like, oh, my buddy knows this guy. Oh, you played with this guy there. And you just don't realize that so many people know so many people. And you travel all over the world and meet some of the coolest people, some of the most down to earth, just humble and honest and just great people. And it's been such a blessing to me. I can't, you know, thank hockey enough for the people they've put in my life, but also the experiences that they've, or that it's given to me. Um, can you kind of go through your process after the crash? What was your process of, you know, thinking about continuing to play? And we know now, you know, you fast forward a few years, you're a public speaker now. So can you take us into now and what your process after the crash was? Yeah, my process after the crash, I think I, I learned a lot about myself and I learned a lot about kind of mental health and that journey. Um, obviously, like I said, it was such a unique situation for us. So we, I don't, I don't think any of us survivors really knew how to, how to cope and how to live with ourselves. So um, those first couple of months were more or less just distracting ourselves and, and kind of putting our mental health on the back burner. So once I kind of got wind that I was able to maybe actually go play again for the Broncos I was like absolutely I just want to go play for all of them I just want to make sure I play for all 29 and and do whatever I can so once I got into that I think that was just such a physical journey and such a physical intention of kind of just getting my body back to where I needed to be that I kind of just put my mental health on the complete back burner again so um, I'm glad I went back and I'm I'm super proud of myself I, I mean coming back from those injuries I, I, I personally thought I was going to be about two-year recovery but I was able to to kind of get my body back to where I needed to be. And, and I was able to play 10 games, which I mean, like I said, I can be super proud of. And I made some friends on that team that I'll have probably for the rest of my life. But um, going back into that dressing room, going back into that billet house, into that rink, everything was just kind of not where I needed to be. So um, I remember having a discussion with my billet mom and she said, if you go home, I want you to promise me that you'll help yourself out and do something for yourself. And, and make sure you focus on your mental health. So I made that promise and I stuck with it. And I uh, I came home and and I was able to kind of decompress and actually put my mental health first, um, which I've never really usually done. Uh, growing up, I was a pretty selfless kid. And even being a dressing room guy, you're never really a self selfish kid. So um, I was able to start my healing journey and I was able to kind of start moving forward. And, and I was able to to get back to kind of the person I was and kind of the person I wanted to be. Cause I know when I left Humboldt, a lot of those guys knew that I was not in a place where I, where I wanted to be and where they thought I was going to be. So um, coming home, it was a, uh, it was a journey, but um, I'm glad I came home because it was able to, it gave me the opportunity to kind of put words on paper and actually put meaning to what I was saying. And, and, you know, I made that promise and, and mental health is not a journey to be won. That's a big thing I've learned. It's a battle every day and it's a grind. And, and I'm, uh, I'm definitely happy where I'm at now. I can make public, well, I guess not be, obviously not with COVID, but I can, uh, I, I was fortunate enough to do quite a few public speech, speaking engagements and, and kind of write my journey in a story as well, which I got immense amounts of, of support from and I didn't expect it. And I think that's kind of what, led me into wanting to continue to help people and, and hopefully make a difference and offer that sense of hope. So, so yeah, now I'm in school. I'm, I'm taking television broadcasting at the school here in Edmonton close by and, and I'm doing as much public speaking as I can. And I'm still trying to learn as much about mental health and kind of that adversity side of, of things as well. So. How do you find opportunities for uh, being a speaker? Do people reach out to you and do you have sort of a, a script that you follow? Do you take questions from the audience? How do those days kind of go? Um, so I'm a pretty, um, I, I like to think I'm a pretty bubbly kid. Like I, I, I love meeting new people. I love connecting. I kind of love networking. So I've been able to, to network to a point where I think I've, I've been fortunate enough to, to make these speeches. And I think that's a big thing. But 
um, when I do my speeches, it kind of ranges. I've done speeches in front of the, the branch of the military close by. I've done speeches in front of high schools. I've done speeches in front of provincial hockey championships. And, and I more or less cater my speeches to my audience. I would love to get to a point where I can just kind of freely speak for an hour, but my first couple of speeches were half paper, half freely speaking. So it's definitely, it's definitely a, a, a big fear of a lot of people. So I'm pretty proud of myself that I'm actually doing it. But um, I, I recently did a speech with Theo Fleury, which was really neat to, to hear his story and, and to hear the way he kind of shared his story. It was neat to see, see his storytelling side of things. So um, I think it's just a, it's an opportunity I have to make a difference and, and to offer that hope. And, and from my story, if I can, if I can make one difference in someone li someone's life, then I'm, I, I think I've done my job. So um, I've been fortunate enough to, to do these speeches and I hope to continue doing them. But like I said, it's definitely kind of almost a who, you know, thing until you have say a speaking agency or, or whatever it may be. So. Yeah, that's a huge part that we were, hoping to be able to help you with by having you on the podcast just hopefully our platform like you said if it can even help one person that's really the goal um unfortunately knowledge comes from tough times and tragedy and you've gone through that uh what is a key or one of the key pieces of advice you would give to anyone who has lost a loved one um yeah so like i think that's still something i'm learning too but um, I, I don't know if I read something or saw something, but I think with grief, a lot of people have a misconception that their your loved one's just gone. But personally, I think that like your grief healing journey, your loved one who you lost or loved ones who you lost are still with you. And I don't think there's any, I don't think there should be a way that you move forward without kind of including them as well. I mean, I still... I still talk to them and I still include them in my life as if they were still here, just because I love, love their memory. And I love kind of just knowing that they're still watching over me. And I think that's a big thing. And, and I mean, I know that sounds cliche that they're watching over you, but I truly, I truly think that is something that you need to take into account and make me need to make important in your life. And, and yeah, I, I would still love to kind of learn more about grief and more about how, how each not each individual, but how kind of people deal with it. But I think a big thing is just kind of moving forward and, and knowing that they're there with you and knowing that they're, they're always going to be there with you. Going back a little bit to your public speaking and you said that you tailor all of your, you know, your public speaking events to the audience that you have. What is like the main goal that you try to get out of it though? Like, do you try to advocate for, you know, mental health awareness what, what are you, what are you trying to show or, you know, teach your audience through your experiences? Yeah, I think advocating for mental health is a big thing for me. Um, now that I actually put mental health at the forefront of my life, I want to be able to kind of put that into fruition in my speeches and in, hopefully into other people's lives. But I, I think another big thing with my speeches is our humble team was so special and we made so many memories and we were all grateful for each other. Even that moment where I kind of, you know, I had those rough couple of days, I knew that I was appreciated and I knew that people were grateful for me. So my speeches, I love to kind of cater around the fact that you really need to just like be grateful for what you have and take into account what you have and appreciate it and live each day truly like it's your last because you really don't know. And I think, I think that kind of resonates with people because I mean, coming from my experience and coming from the tragedy and I think if I can share my story about it and put it into words, I think it's big for other people just to realize that, you know what? Yeah. Maybe I need to start doing that more. And I, maybe I need to tell my loved ones that I love them more, or maybe I need to really just appreciate what this thing in my life or this person in my life or, or little things like that. And I mean, it all adds up and, and I mean, every memory made is, is a hopefully truly a special one. Like it was on our humble team. And sometimes that's the last thing you can really hold on to. So um, just kind of making sure that I, I preach that make those memories and be grateful and, and love the ones that you love and, and tell them that you love them and, and all those kind of things tie into more or less what I like to talk about. You're doing fantastic work for mental health, which 
has really come to the forefront in the last couple of years. I know you um, work with my old teammate, Aiden Gerdakis and his company, Ducky Brand. Uh, they advocate mental health and it's really inspirational to hear how you're continuing to push forward and just trying to help people every step of the way you can. Thank you so much for coming on our podcast. We loved hearing your story and learning from you. And just to reiterate, if we can help one person, that really would make this whole process worth it for us. And I know it would for you too. So thank you so much. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks boys. I, I, I love to talk to you and I hopefully we can do this again sometime and hopefully in person, I'd love to make it down to, to Colorado in the coming future, but obviously there's different circumstances right now, but let's hit the red rock soon. And thanks for having me on. Yeah, absolutely, buddy. Can't wait. That was awesome, man. Thank you so much. Um, uh, we talked about the tattoo picture, so I definitely want to use that when we promote um, your episode. Okay. If there were yeah. any other pictures of you playing, public speaking, anything like that, um, you could email those to us if you want, or else we'll probably okay. just find them on your social media or whatever. Um, okay. We have a Navy SEAL coming on next Monday, so you'll be released the okay. one after that. Um, Sweet. Like 13 days, I think it is. Yeah. So right around there. And then obviously, if you want to, we'd love if you repost on your story just to yeah. you know, reach your audience and – Obviously, I'm sure they follow you for a reason. and You're big into public speaking too. So maybe we asked a few questions that they may have, you know, haven't heard before. So they can get to know you a little bit better and maybe a little bit more about your journey and not so much just specifically the bus crash. Yeah. Um, but I think it's awesome, man. Like, I think it's really cool that you found something outside of hockey that you truly enjoy. And not only that, but you're helping so many other people too. So I have, like I said, I don't know you, but I can tell that you're a man of character and I respect what you're doing. And appreciate what you're doing because there are people out there that struggle very bad with mental health and just having one person there to support them means the world to them whether you realize that or not absolutely couldn't agree more yeah keep doing what you guys are doing too i mean this is this is big and i think you guys are changing lives too so uh keep doing what you're doing i yeah i'm gonna have to tune into that navy school one too that'll be a new one to listen to right yeah, for sure um yeah and i love your idea about red rocks if uh you get, if you <laughs> yeah. get a chance to come down you got my number buddy Let's do it. Yeah, I'd love to. I'd love to hit that up. But uh, yeah, thanks again for having me on, boys. Honestly, thank you. Thank you very much. And and shoot me that. Uh, you, what are you guys posting on Instagram? Yeah. So yeah. the actual podcast is on Spotify or um, Apple Podcasts. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll I'll look it up on Spotify and then put it on my Instagram story or Twitter or whatever it may be. Well, yeah, awesome. uh, I'll tag you in the Instagram and then on the Twitter too. So if you just want to repost it, that'd probably be easier. Okay. Awesome. Perfect. Yeah, that'd be awesome. You're the man, dude. Okay, take care, boys. Yeah, see ya. Bye. Take care.